Father, we come to your weakness today and we come to you in need of your strength and help and your uh, speaking to us really. For us and to those who are not with us because uh, so many way again today. We ask for your presence and your power and we ask you to teach us from your word and help us to be uh, genuine, real, authentic, but biblical. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. The uh, <coughs> little thing on the wall there is uh, from John Piper. Um, marriage, the roots are deep, the covenant is solid, love is sweet and life is hard. Oh, life is hard and God is good. John Piper. Let me read that again. Marriage, the roots are deep, the covenant is solid, love is sweet, life is hard and God is good. Uh, it puts the whole thing about marriage and being a husband and being a wife in perspective, doesn't it? Because it's really hard going. <laughs> it can be so hard going because we're sinful human beings. Our world is a sinful world. It's a difficult world to live in. And uh, there are times when we just need to, you know, God is the one who actually makes any of this work in the first place. God is the only one who can make any of this work for us. And uh, this is where we're at. We're coming to scripture in a contemporary, co- against a contemporary context where uh, marriage isn't viewed in that light at all. Uh, it's viewed in a very, very different way. And it seems to me that this whole passage that we've got in front of us today, where Paul is saying, wives submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord, and where he's saying, husbands love your wives, we find that uh, tough and difficult uh, to think about, and the context is the key to all of it. It's a pair of verses, Colossians 3, 17 and 18, 17, 18, 18 and 19, um, it's a passage of scripture which is leads heavily on the context in which it's set. Mm-hmm. And most of the time we need to spend on, on thinking about its context, its contemporary and then its biblical context. Or we're going to fall over it. We're going to trip up on it and it's going to give us hiccups. Okay? Uh, we won't get it sorted. If we can get the context sorted out, then when we get to the verse it will readily snap into place. Oh, I hope so. Um, and after 30 years of being married, I, I think I'm not doing very well. I don't feel I do particularly well on this. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Do you want to hear about marriage from somebody who is an expert and everything goes perfectly and suddenly? Or would you rather hear from somebody about it who has to really work at it? Or does that work out a lot of things over time? As time's gone by. Ministry is not an easy thing for a marriage. Um, I did try and talk my wife out of it um, because that was going to be hard work being alongside me for the rest of our lives, hopefully. Uh, when, we were, when, we, um, when we were thinking about it, and she wasn't that many then. Um, mostly she hasn't been on any today, because otherwise she might have a different view today, I don't know. But uh, certainly, you know, let's be clear about this. In the contemporary context, and in any event, because of the nature of things, marriage is difficult. But it's worth having. Now let's look at contemporary context to start with. So we get the context right and then we can perhaps put things in, in a bit more perspective. As you can see, there's a little man sitting there questioning marriage on the screen now. Because in the contemporary context, marriage is heavily, heavily questioned. Heavily questioned. And we live in a world where that's been pushed at us all the time. Bear in mind, marriage has been questioned in Paul's day too. There's a lot that's been written about disgruntled Roman matrons, right? Um, Roman social life was pretty hard on senior women, uh, desperately hard for women at the bottom of society. But on the top of society, you know, their position was a very difficult one, and there were a lot of them about. And a lot of them, reacting against the immorality of the time and the impact of all these things on their lives, were actually going on to the synagogues, trying to find something different. And you find very often Paul's Missionary strategy is influenced by that fact because quite a lot of the people... Well, take Philippi as an example. There's a bunch of women down by the river reading the Bible on a Saturday, Sabbath day, because um, they're looking for something. And there weren't enough men for a synagogue in a cosmopolitan place like Philippi. So there's that going on. Marriage is getting a bit of a hit in Paul's day for that reason. And also because of proto Gnosticism. Now we know about the situation in Colossae. We know that Paul is writing to Colossians. This is Colossians 3. We know that there there was a problem with proto Gnosticism. And the reaction of proto Gnosticism against the situation of women in society was to say there is no difference between men and women. They are the same. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And Paul's saying it's not quite right. 
That's not quite right, either. Paul sets it all in a biblical context, but in terms of God's ordering of society in a particular way, and in the setting of our acknowledgement of God's authority over us, the Lordship of Christ. Who says all of your lives like this? So our society looks at, as Paul did, looks at marriage as a failed institution. People have given up on marriage. Young people don't get married. They find some other ways. And people turn their backs on their own marriages and walk away quite easily where there's not some other constraint. Taking comfort in this, marriage is a failed institution anyway. And off they go and life becomes harder and harder. Because it's not quite the way we were built to be. In the contemporary context then, marriage is viewed as a failed institution and of human origin. Contemporary culture sees marriage as a convenience or a useful social convention. Giving respectability to underlying human urges. A useful social convention. Something people have dreamt up for social safety in view of the urge to breed. And the Bible says otherwise. The Bible says God made mankind in two ways. He made them male and female. And why are they different? And he made them that way because it was not good for man to be alone. So God made an opposite for him. You realise that. The Hebrew there is saying God made him a counterbalance. It's take an egg though somebody would swing out the other way from him. Marriage then, biblically, is a union, lots of other things, between two people who swing out in different directions. It's going to be really easy. Cake walk, piece of cake. You know, I've, I've just seen so many books published, not read them to the end, um, and heard people, you know, doing seminars on marriage, you know, and their, their marriage has been perfect. They have had no issues at all. You think, <laughs> did you marry a bloke? Did you marry a girl? What happens? Because <laughs> men and women are just opposites. And the point is, God has made marriage as a union of people who tend to swing out in opposite directions as a balance to one another. it wasn't good for a man to be alone. Now the contemporary context sees this failed institution of human origin as the fault of an outdated church institution. They blame it on the church. Possibly because of the things we've been talking about, but probably because of the, of the institution, uh, institutionalization of marriage in our culture after the Marriage Act of 1870, wasn't it? Marriage isn't working. Who blame it on the church? Because they say you ought to get married. It isn't working because people haven't grasped to embrace God's plan for marriage, and it isn't therefore working. Of course, it isn't working. But we blame it on the church because they say you ought to get married. It's their fault. Seen as the church moralising, moralising for more than people can do, and therefore the pain and the breakdown is the church's fault. And I see that. Regularly, you know my ministry is very much with people who are outside church life. I see that all the time. And because of that, people are seeing marriage as available for political redefinition. It has been largely socially redefined. What we need now is the politicians to put some seal of approval on it. That is the case for heterosexual marriage, which is what marriage is. But there's pressure coming in from openly gay or pro-gay politicians and pressure groups now to redefine marriage in ways that suit there as well. Suit them, but may not in the long run, because this isn't the way it works. Biblically, we'll see in a minute. Marriage is between a man and a woman. It's an exclusive union for life and so on. Well, let's just do that. Let's do it. Because the whole thing we're talking about is this, this view that Marriage is a human institution, and a flaw of them, uh, because it's not been running quite the way that uh, God intended. Let's have a look at how it was intended. This has just been borne out this week by the Christian chap who um, lost it, got demoted, and um, also took a huge cut in his wages because he said exactly this, but it's been overturned. There's been a case in the news recently mm -hmm. with a guy who, who 
I can't remember what his job was. My he, was work, he, no, he was working in a housing association. Working in a housing association. He used his point on Facebook. He expressed, yeah, he expressed an opinion on his Facebook, personal involvement, whatever Facebook thing. Um, the marriage was this, not something else. Um, it was man. Yeah. And um, yes, they disciplined him at work. Mm -hmm. He's actually won his case this week because he's allowed to hold that opinion. Yeah. Well, he's holding this opinion. It's just in Genesis chapter 2, um, verse 20. For Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, because she was taken out of the man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, they will become one flesh. God has instituted what we have come to know as marriage. Now, along the way, all sorts of things have been added to that. All sorts of extraneous stuff gets stuck to the outside of it. But here's what God has done biblically to define what marriage actually is. Man is different from a woman. The two of them get together in this way. A man leaves his father and mother joins to his wife, they are now a social unit, they identify with each other, they are together in union, <coughs> the two become one that flesh. It's a sexual relationship. Not around that one, that's what it is. Now all sorts of things come into play. All sorts of uh, <coughs> things have to be said about that, but that's the basic normal setup. Please notice that it's divine, not human in origin. And what that means is we don't own it. To fiddle with it. Every one of us will, you know, in marriage, will have, a, you know, quite a lot of us are married, and quite a lot of us are getting married. <laughs> so, they're quite nervous making the responsibility of this. Uh, others of us might be thinking about it. So, um, you know, bear in mind, this is, this is an agreement that's freely entered into. It's a human, it's not a human origin, but humanly, we express the divine institution through ourselves. So what I mean is this. My marriage will be the same as your marriage. Could be quite different from your marriage, but we're expressing the same biblical principles in a different way. Or we're expressing those same biblical principles in a different cultural context. So if I behaved, I don't know, but I'm guessing. Let's say I behaved the way a Balkans man would be expected to behave in his marriage, in my marriage, might not go down too well. Is that fair? You're laughing. <laughs> I am. You are laughing, yeah. It wouldn't go down too well at all. And vice versa. Because the biblical principles exist, but we have to express that ourselves in our relationships and in our cultures. There will be huge differences. You read some of the books on marriage that are out there, don't you? And what, what they do is they, they forget that. And they say, this is the method. This is how you run. No, guys. No, ladies. It's not. We express biblical principle to work it out together. It's a covenant. That's the next thing I need to say. It's a covenant, not a contract. I buy into the fact that what I do as a husband is this. My wife buys into the, you know, I'm speaking generically, a husband, a wife, buys into the fact that this is what she does as a wife. She doesn't buy into, I'm going to do this if you do that. And that's the difference between a covenant and a contract. Did I make it clear or should I say it again? A covenant is saying, I am going to do this. And when you walk up the aisle and you stand there, and she's standing next to you, she looks lovely. What happens is, you promise to do certain things. You don't promise to do those things if she does some other things for you. It's not the deal. You promise to do those things. Now she stands there, and she says, you know, after you've done your bit, which is risky, after you've done your bit, she says her bit. So there's a pause there. I mean, things could go wrong in that gap. No, because it's a covenant, not a contract. I will do this. It's not, I'll do this if you'll do that and if you don't know how. I'll do this. 
No one ever steer of you. But in the fear of God. Boy, that's tough. The contracts don't work in this setting. And it's a covenant of companionship that God has set up. It's what it's for. Now I know many churches have words in them, and when you go through the marriage service, it says, this is for the procreation of children. It might be. But it might not be. It's not for that. It's not a wrecked and failed marriage, if that doesn't happen. That's a matter of the call of God as well. It wasn't instituted for that nonsense. It was instituted as a covenant companionship between two people. God blesses with children, calls you to that tremendous privilege and honour. Then that's right for you. Maybe he's not going to. Maybe he's not going to. Maybe he doesn't he calls you to that as well. Ooh, that can hurt one. That can hurt. But maybe he's called you to express his grace and his covenant of marriage and the sufficiency of God in that way. And I understand a little of how hard that can be for some people. It's a divine, not human, covenant, not contract. Not to breed, but to be a good companion for that person. Not the same as that person, but a good companion who sees the other side of things. It's a divine, not human covenant of companionship between equals. Between equals, biblically. There's Adam and there's Eve. There's Ish and Ishar. Not little Ish, right? But female Ish is what it means in the Hebrew. It doesn't mean lesser Ish. It means same as Ish, but different from Ish. <laughs> Less than the Hebrew here. <laughs> And it's structured. It's a structured relationship. An ordered and a structured relationship with principles which we then have to work out, as we'll see a bit later on as we look at our text. It's not a command structure, it's an ordering of society. And that's a different thing altogether. No guy should walk away and think, oh, here we are. I'm in command. <laughs> no! <laughs> no. It's not biblical. And all the employees are walking away with it because it wouldn't be right because you're supposed to be a union, a covenant of two opposite people balancing each other. Somebody once said, um, was talking about this exclusive point. It's an exclusive covenant, forsaking all other. You know, um, a man leaves his father and mother before he's joined to his wife. He leaves his father and mother, then he's joined to his wife, and the two become one new social unit. It's an exclusive relationship. Somebody expressed it like this. It was an American guy many years ago. He said, uh, he talked about leaving, cleaving in one flesh. <laughs> leave, cleave, one flesh. Um, you leave your husband, you leave your father and mother, and you cleave to your wife, and become one flesh. It's an exclusive sort of relationship. And it's a sexual relationship. Um, the important thing here is, is that, that companionship thing. Because obviously we think of sexual relationships as being procreative, but they ain't always. It's not what it's for. What it's for is for cementing a union between two people. A man it does, and that's the trouble with the permissive society so often. We find people have cemented and then broken and cemented and broken. It's like a weld. You actually break a weld, you break off a lump of metal from the other side, you know? And it's harmful and damaging. And it can hurt like crazy. Well, what marriage is not biblically then is what uh, most people seem in our society to make of it most of the time. Um, we've seen what our society makes of it, and we've looked at what the Bible makes of it, and we try to put the two together, and we're saying what marriage is not biblically is what most people are rejecting as a failed institution. Does that make sense? So, what's the text all about then? Structured mutuality in difference. Not in difference, but in being different. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense?
come to ask you a question. Do you see how that works? That, these texts in Colossians 3 about relationships. This is how they work out. A party is named. Wives, husbands, children, fathers, slaves. Right? A party is somebody in society. An institution. Uh, you know, people. A group of people in society is named. And then there's a command issued. And that's what it is. Who do you think is a command? It's, it's set up grammatically like that. Do this. Take it you do this. And then there's a motivating statement. Which is why we do this. So, wives, submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, and they will become discouraged. Right. Slaves, obey your earthly masters and everything. Out of sincerity, heart, and reverence to the Lord, and those are good things that should be motivated. You see how it works. Wives, submit to your husbands, and that just is fire on the skin, isn't it? Because of our view in society of the way things are and should be at the moment. If I say to somebody who's not really a citizen, you know, you threaten to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, right? He did submit to Jesus because he's the Lord. Oh, no, no. Why are you saying that? He's saying that because he hasn't seen how benign God is, <laughs> how loving and caring God is. And it sounds like submit to anybody else is just an imposition on me. That's a terrible, awful thing. It's a bad. Our society defines that as being a bad. And that carries over into all sorts of relationships. Not just our relationship with the Lord, that carries over into children submit to parents. Wives submit to husbands. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think all this is even saying in Colossae? So Paul could have left this because there's trouble in the church of Colossae, you know? And these prognostics are coming in with a much more tasty message saying, no, women men different. No, no difference, just all the same. Yeah. Why do you think he, he's having to say all this in Colossae? Well, we know about Colossae that the economy has fallen apart. We know that at Colossae the road has been moved northwards towards Laodicea, and so all the trade isn't coming through, so the, the business isn't there, so the jobs aren't there. And the trade is now going by Laodicea down to Ephesus to the port, and Colossae's become an economic backwater. They've got a structural recession they can't get into. The economy has fallen apart. The employment situation is completely wrecked. There's social and economic dislocation there and deprivation on a big scale in that place. Can't you hear in the background their wives despising their husbands because of their lost earning potential, the dashing of their material hopes, their aspirations are gone. And can't you see their children learning the same sort of attitude from their frustrated and disappointed mothers? I can. Can't you see husbands exasperated at their situation, at the challenging behaviour of their disillusioned wives, making defensive, over-strong reactions, becoming autocrats in an attempt to just pull the situation back? Can't you hear that? Because I can. Making over-strong reactions, becoming short-tempered, hardened, and his pulse is harsh. I can see that. And can't you see all that being taken out on wives and children instead of calling families back to biblical patterns of aspiration, biblical patterns of response to the other members of their household, respect for God's ordering and family and society? Wives, says Paul, here's what we need you to do. Paul is a scary man. He's a scary guy. He's a dangerous guy. He's prepared to go around a congregation where things are going wrong. He's not even there be able to deal with the flack and sort it out afterwards. He's prepared to go around and go and point at an empty chair. Okay? <laughs> Just so everybody knows. <laughs> you. <laughs> Have you the courage to do that? I mean, imagine doing that. Imagine, you know, saying this from fresh. I'm, I'm, I'm safe. I'm just saying, guys, I'm just trying to work out what the Bible is saying to us. Yeah? It's safe for me, isn't it? Paul's going, you. This is what I need you to do. It's what God needs you to do. Submit to your husband. I'm going to say what that means in a minute. We'll put us there, there. Toys, egos, and brassy. Please notice, this is not about their gender. This is not women obey men. It's not what this is saying at all. That Greek will not support that at all one bit. It's not about your gender. It's about your relationship. Because, look, the saying. Be properly ordered. Uh, we'll talk about that word. Be in this relationship with your own 
band with your own man. That's interesting, isn't it? You've gone out of his way to say that. with your own man. You've entered into this relationship, this covenant with this guy, and it, it doesn't come, you know, like McCann, where you can pull bits on and take bits off and do what you like there. No, God has made an ordering of human society in a particular way, and, and that's what the book of Isaiah is saying. It's your own guy. It's not about gender, it's about your relationship with that person. Two people in that relationship. Does that make sense? Does that mean that's important? That's important. And then there's this word here, which our NIV translates submit. Well, it's a passive tense. It's a passive voice. And what that means is um, be ordered, be structured in this particular way. That word hupotasso means uh, there is an existing order, there is an existing structure in the state or in the church or in our relationship to Christ because those are contexts in which that word is used. Now that is the proper way, that is the proper relationship. Be in proper relationship in that way with your husband who is supposed to be a leader in your home. Can you see the snag with that? It's not always going to get it right. He's not always going to get it to the taste of everybody. <laughs> Certainly not to the taste of his wife, because we've seen already she's an opposite to him. But he's going to have to love her. And that should take into account the difficulty that she's going to have with doing this. Why submit to your husband? That's what we brought into. If you're not going to buy into that, don't buy into marriage, says Paul, because that's what it is. There is a structure, there is a nature of a relationship. Do it like this. Husbands, now, oh, should have said, uh, he says, do this because that's fitting in the Lord, that's appropriate, that is the right way. In Christ. Wives do that, husbands love your wives. This is where it gets tough. And certainly we can all go back, we can all say, no doubt, we've been married for a little while, we can all go back and say, I thought it was the right thing, no, it wasn't the right thing at all. You know? Should have loved that woman in this way, expressed it in this way. The principle is clear, love your wives, and you know, we go out and we want to do that. And do that with all, we want to do that with all your heart, and still really screw it up. Really good. And then you can be in a situation where, um, you really want to do that, and there's something you know that, that will be received as love, that will be taken as being the loving thing from you. So it will be ex accepted as an expression of your love, and you just can't do it. You just can't do it. You're not in a position, you haven't been given the opportunity to do that, and you want to do that, maybe you can blow your heart, and you can't do that. So your hands. And God calls us to do what we can do. Not what we can. We acknowledge that when it comes to money, don't we? You know, when it comes to giving, you know, it's all proportionate, isn't it? It's according to our means, what we have to do with it. Love has to be according to means as well. But it has to be. In a parallel passage in Ephesians 5, Paul talks about husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He loved the church of all he had. He just put it all down, it wasn't for him, it was for them. Now, that's difficult. That's it's so hard. And it may be something that a husband wants to do, and he just gets it wrong. It may be something that a wife really wants him to do, and he just doesn't seem to get it. Um, I guess we've all been in that position. It is getting it thing. Have you come across this? You've been in a different culture for a long time. Um, as guys, we often don't get used to get it. <laughs> Just don't get it. What about that? Husbands love your wives. Now, it's not a contract, it's a covenant. And it's not, that, so it's, it's not actually with your wife in that sense, so much as with God, in this sense. Um, and as if God is standing there saying, go and love her. 
trouble is, what we hear so often is the worst. If you read that thing, you won't. <laughs> you know? Why do we get this wrong? And boy, you've only got sinners to make marriages out of. And boy, there are three little phrases of three words each that are going to be so, so needed in a marriage that's set up and works in this way. And I remember, I remember preaching this in a, at least in a funeral, in a wedding, years and years and years ago, and the person who was wedding was came back to me about it again recently. Do you remember you said, I said, not very often people remember your, your sermons like that. Three, three phrases, three words each, that we're going to need in this sort of marriage that God is asking for. And those are, I was wrong. Now the reason for that is we're all sinners, aren't we? <laughs> we can become screw up and we don't want to. Do I was wrong. I am sorry. That's the three hardest words in the human language, in the English language. English language. I am sorry. And it gets interesting again. Please forgive me. There are two potential answers to that question. Please forgive me. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And how often, in terms of you know, loving our wives and not being burdensome and not being harsh and not being picky, because the word the word actually means, you know, it says, love your wife, do not be harsh with them. Decrino means to be picky. How often do we need those three phrases? Quite a lot. Because God has chosen to make marriage and make it in a particular way using human beings. Adam and Eve didn't start off with that problem, of course, because it says immediately after it says a man shall leave his husband, leave his mother and father, and cleave to his wife and, 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 and one flesh. Um, all that stuff. Um, it then said, um, it says straight away, and they were naked with me no shame. Now, why did it say that straight afterwards? Because they weren't getting anything wrong in their marriage. Nothing was going wrong at that stage, and sin had ended sins. And that's what makes it such a difficult proposition, such a hard one, and yet under the blessing of God, such a useful one to be working out. So what have we got? A verse that I have to say is really hard to preach on. <laughs> Why submit to your husbands? In the relationship, what it means is in that relationship that God has created. Relating in the way that God has made. Husbands love your wives. Party name? I'm talking to you. Command issue? Submit to your husbands. Love your wives. How much of a safeguard on that should that be? How much more often should it be, we're not agreeing on this, okay love, we'll do it your way, but I'm still responsible. Because that's the deal actually, isn't it guys? Afraid so. <laughs> it is the deal. I'm going to do it your way because I love you and I want to consider you. Right? But at the end of the day, it's going to come back on me. Because I'm part of it. And then there's this motivating statement. As is fitting in the Lord, do not be harsh, because that, that would so obviously be wrong. And you don't want to be those things. The difficulty being we are so very different. What happens when somebody is ill? That can really, really throw up huge problems. Can't it? What happens when somebody goes through a, a period of personal crisis, maybe psychological disturbance? Oh, how high is that? Illness, disability. Oh. Situation where one becomes a believer and the other is not. Singing off the same sheet. How hard is that? It's easy to say, I promise to love you. It's easy to say, how much do we need help with this? We need each other's help with this, don't we? I don't know how that works. I don't know how does that work. Spirit is willing, but the flesh will be the thinking and be distinctly retarded. I don't know. The guy just seems to me that in a world where God has ordered society to be in a particular way, and he's told us very plainly, 
and where our world is defining things so very, very different, and the contemporary context is so against it. We need to be clear about what marriage is, what marriage is not. Ready to stand for that as gently and as caringly as we can, knowing that people are dealing with difficult, difficult situations, potentially, around all these discussions. Careful to look after our own structured mutuality, which is what God has ordained. Honest about it, rather than pretending everything in the garden is just absolutely, you know, strawberries and cream. Doesn't that make you sick? <laughs> And prayerful. Prayerful that the God who is actually the key to any of this working at all would support our family, would support our marriages, would help those who are developing and growing their lives into that relationship, and those who have been battered around in it for quite a long time, not getting it all right. God would help and sustain and undertake for our human imperfection in an institution that is potentially great and glorious. Amen.